Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello and welcome to Homeschool Together. Thanks so much for joining us. If you have a chance, you could be that person that puts us over 50 reviews. <laughs> Check down in the show notes below. Are we right there? Click on the link. We are on the, we're on the cusp. We're on the precipice <laughs> of I love greatness. It. Some people are born great. Some people are like us. We got to work for it. <laughs> we, we work for it. We, right. we work for it. We, we work, work hard. It. Now, all of you out there know that you are a fine curators of curriculum. You reach out and nab up every single unit study that is, you know, two percent off on the on the on Black Friday. Hey, hey you, now. You buy two for one deals at a, a build your library. You you go out there and that's not a thing. And obscure you you went out there and you bought the boat school unit study just in case <laughs> you decided to get that you know, fifteen foot catamaran out the back of the back of the property and put it in the water, just in case. Some of you have dabbled in pool school and you're in tech twelve foot, uh, thirty inch depth pool in your backyard because it's super hot out right now. We all have lots of stuff. We have lots of books. I feel like you're. I feel like I'm being judged here. Uh, well, you're looking at the wall of curriculum. Well, right, right in our office, right and now, you're judging me. Right now, we are six feet apart, so I'm judging you from a distance. Very far distance, safe distance, as I would like to to stress. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to talk about you're at home, you've got all the things, like they are over my shoulder, and you need to organize those things. We struggle with this problem all the time. We certainly do. We have so many curriculums, we're doing so many things. Yep. We have so many curriculums that we've finished. We have a rapidly, like, we're talking like, SpaceX brand new rocket launch three-year-old who's about ready to start doing things and we need to prepare ourselves for what's coming up we have curriculum that we're ready to roll out I'm about to do a big changeover in curriculum leaving one curriculum and starting a new curriculum we know you're having the same problems at home and today we're going to talk a little bit about how to organize your entire homeschool yeah so this is going to be physically and digitally. Right. Oh. This is going to be one of those, uh, we're going to give lots of ideas and tell you what we do or maybe more uh, accurately what we want to do. It's yep. a little bit chaotic because of said three-year-old. Uh, and we have got some things all over the place. We're still we're still in the process of bringing things back down from that five foot height that she yeah. couldn't reach, um, and trying to get some things organized. So, but I, well, there's lots of good ideas here for you because I, I know I we feel, have a lot of things. I feel like around. I feel like a lot of times we're in flux because we're either in this homeschool space or in this homeschool space. We're doing these curriculums. We're not like this summer has been a big wild change because normally we're at the parent partnership. And I'm spending a lot of time there. I have my bags and my go bags and we got all my stuff ready to go. I got my crates. I feel like I'm now going to be moving back up to the other bonus room to do a lot of our, you know, our reading and our math curriculums because I'm graduating from these other math, you know, other curriculums that tend to be more mobile curriculums. And now I'm going to be more focused on all the materials that are, that I have to have. And those tend to live upstairs. So like, I, I always feel like I'm like, going from one thing to the next and and maybe a lot of people are are, have that same experience like as they're moving through even with different age students and probably even in some wild scenarios you may have kids you know you may have one kid finishing a curriculum moving forward really fast while your other kids are you know moving forward at their own speed and you're kind of all over the place and and it can feel kind of wild and chaotic at times yeah, it's true. It's hard to keep everything straight. You you know, what you said is true. We, we've bought a lot of things uh, for now and for later. And those things are not just entities in and of themselves, right? That There's also 
uh, other supplements of manipulatives or cards that come with yeah. them or books that we need to buy to support those yeah. pieces of curriculum. And so it, it's not just uh, picking up one thing. It's or, or you're at all the things. Or you're at Target and you said, hey, they're... Their dollar bin's got some cool math cards or some cool manipulatives. Oh, man, where do so I, many things. Where do I put those things? Where where do I accumulate them? Neither they're going to confirm nor deny that we just have bins with Target stuff, <laughs> dollar spot stuff that we're like, I'm like, well, we need this. They're like, but it's teaching multiplication. We're not doing that yet. I'm like, yeah, but when we are, this is great. So, yeah. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we'll get there. So we wanted to start talking about um, why it's so important to choose an organization system, because when you start out with, with one kid and you start out with pre-K or kindergarten, it's pretty easy, right? You've, you've got, Hey, I'm doing like one, maybe one main curriculum and maybe you're yeah. doing a, a math and a reading. Maybe, right. maybe you have three things or maybe you're doing an all in one right. at that age. Most things are kind of all in one. If you could be doing like torchlight pre-K, it's got everything, uh, or blossom and root or one of those. So it's pretty easy. You've got one kid, one thing going on. Uh, then, you know, fast forward a few years and you have two or three children. And not only is everybody on their own level, but even within those grades, you've got one kid who's maybe more advanced in math and another kid who's not as advanced in reading. And so you can't even just, you can't even just say like, oh, I have a third grader who's using all third grade curriculum because it almost never happens that way. You're going to have a third grader who is reading at a fourth grade level and doing math at a third grade level, but doing an all in one program with his sibling at a second grade level. And then you're, you know, making it a little bit harder for him. Like it's going to be that kind of thing. So it gets to be really complex as the years go on. And then every level you go through, especially when you have multiple children, Mm -hmm. you're buying something, you're going to use it. And you know, we're all thrifty. We're going to use it for the second child. I mean, assuming praying that it works, that, you know, meshes with their learning style. It'll it'll at least be our first stab. Right. Our first stab is to go back to the thing that we already bought and try to use that um, so you've got to keep those old curriculums around. It's not like they just they just disappeared. So this is how they grow. Year after year, the amount of curriculum that you have just continues to compound, and you've got kids working at all different levels and some doing things together. It's crazy. So but it is important to figure things out. Something you do a really good job about is is kind of preparing for the coming year too. So you're loading up, you're, you're prepping the walls of books and the curriculum you're thinking a year, maybe two years ahead, and you're you're trying to, you know, either buy curriculum books or buy chapter books or buy, you know, reader books, um, whatever that might be. That's something you've done a really good job about and like loading up all that that material somewhere. You gotta put it somewhere. Yeah, exactly. You know, what you're saying is is totally true. You know, it the other thing about about this, you know, having a system is it makes your planning so much easier. You're talking about me like prepping for the next school year, knowing where my curriculum is at and where the books for it are at makes all my planning easier. So it really is important to have a system. You can't just shove them on a bookshelf somewhere. You can, and we've done that and it it really doesn't work. So (laughs) we want to talk about why we need to organize. You know, the other thing is that we need to consider a couple of different types of storage. You talked about both physical and digital, but we're going to break physical up a little bit more into long-term storage and short-term storage. So think about it in these kind of terms. Uh, Your long-term storage, I've got a kindergartner. This is a great example. I have a kindergartner, he's a rising first grader now, who has finished all about reading level one. I have all those materials, but our next daughter is only three. So yeah. she's not doing that for three more years. In my ter- in my mind, that's a long-term storage situation. I don't need to look at that curriculum again. I need to put it someplace out of the way where I can yeah. easily find it and it's organized so I know where it is. Um, but I-, I don't need it right now. It doesn't need to take up what is very valuable real estate on our bookshelves and in our bins. So that's the kind of thing. Whereas The next thing we're doing, right, we're going to go into um, a prehistory through the rest of 2022. And at the start of 2023, sometime January, February, we're going to move into Build Your Library Level 1 and start with the ancient world. That is on my short term. I'm not using it right this minute, but 
I'm I'm planning ahead. Preparing, I'm going to yeah. be getting there. I'm going to be preparing for it. Getting so, books yeah, books. kind of thinking about things in those terms. Unless you just have unlimited bookshelf space, but I've never met a homeschooler that does. No. So if you're out there, you know, you can just I mean, give us a wave. Yeah, but it, nobody ever seems to have unlimited shelf space. Yeah, every time we get a new bookcase, it just fills up immediately. Yeah. It's like, it's a, like a license to buy more books. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. Well, we can't get rid of these now. We got places to put them. <laughs> right. I mean, that Target buy two, get one free sale is not going to run itself. Like no, a... Exactly. So let, let's go ahead and get started. Um, obviously, the most important storage area or you know storage philosophy is obviously the physical books because a lot of times or the physical curriculum or the the physicalness of our curriculums is probably the most prominent thing. It takes Mo- up the most space. Most of the books <laughs> that we, we buy are... You know, they're physical books. We're not. We're not getting. You know, we do have digital curriculums. Yeah, we do, and we'll we'll talk all through we'll talk digital about those. stuff. But but like most most curriculums that most people are using are you know print books like the Right Start Math books or the All About Reading books. Mm-hmm. Um, those all need your to, workbooks. Yeah, right. Those need to live somewhere and be somewhere. Um, so how how do we think about like where do we start with a you know we got all this curriculum you know parent is out there they're starting kindergarten maybe they're starting first grade second third, third grade. This is their first year. Maybe they've been doing it for a year or so, and it, but it was really chaotic and hectic. So where can they start first with respect to their physical curriculums, the books, the things that they can hold in their hands? Yeah. So the first step is to evaluate your space. Yeah. What kind of space do you have? Do you have, um, you know, can you clear some of your bookshelves? Like mm-hmm. what's, what does that storage situation look like? Do you have bookshelf space? Are you, are you limited by bookshelf space? So maybe you want to use some sort of like boxes or bins. Yeah. Like what if I have very limited bookshelf space, but I have plenty of closet space, <laughs> plenty. I'm using plenty loosely because nobody else has plenty of nobody closet space, plenty but of let's space. say you have closet, closet space. You're like, yeah, I can deal with it. We have like, for example, in our homeschool room, we have like kind of this uh, higher ledge yeah. that I think of as like great long-term storage because no one ever really wants to get up there. We technically can store some bins up there and we do. <laughs> and that's like the stuff that I know we don't need to touch for a while. Yeah. Um, so, you know, really evaluate what kind of space do you have? Can you clear some bookshelves off? One of the things we found is we were able to consolidate some of our books together in other rooms to free up area in our homeschool room mm-hmm. and bookshelves in our homeschool room and we recently were, was were able to do that and that was really great we were able to move a lot of things there so you know really evaluate your space see what you have room for um our our is bookshelf space the thing? Would boxes work better or crates? Maybe you're a rolling cart family. You've got some, you don't have bookshelf space or room to store things, but you can deal with a rolling cart, kind of just roll it out of the way when you're not using it. And you can roll it in with all of your or, current or, curriculum. Or maybe they're a mobile family. They got to go to a co-op. They have dance classes, sports. They go to a parent partnership. They have to go to some event every week and they need to take their materials with them, right. you may live in your suitcase. You may be a suitcase homeschooling family. Right. Or, this could or look like, like the anything. rolling crate. Like we, we see this mm-hmm. at the parent partnership a lot of times. They come in with the giant, you know, lawyer uh, crate boxes that have, yeah. they look, they have like the, the extendable arm, like, a, Those like are cool. a rolling suitcase. Like if you're traveling like through an airport or something, they, they have these and they just pop them open and, you know, the top box, they pop it open. That's where all the snacks go. And then the one below it is where all the homeschool materials are. Right. And I could just imagine when they roll back into the house, they just wheel that into their homeschool space and they just live out of that box. Exactly. Yeah. Mobile crates. There's a lot of different solutions, but really understand your space and what's going to work for you. Yeah. And and when you're evaluating your space, think forward yeah. <laughs> in that the amount of curriculum that you have is only going to grow unless you have one child and you're planning to purge curriculum after you're done with it and mm-hmm. just keep the current and upcoming stuff. That's great. But if you have more than one child, um, it's going to just start accumulating. Well, so, it, you know, think yeah. a little bit about like, where am I going to start now? Exactly. And then where am I going to go? And you may think, Oh, I'm just going to purge my, you know, my explode the code workbooks or whatever. But sometimes there are, Books that have really good short stories, they have good uh, early readers, you, you can't anticipate that you're going to purge everything. Right. You may keep it for some amount of time. Yeah. And, you know, we tend to keep even completed workbooks for a bit uh, so that we can see, we can judge our daughter's progress through the year. Yeah. Eventually, we do purge them, but we do keep them for a while. So really think about that with your space. What have so, you got now? Yeah, what do you think I, you're going to be in the future? I was, I was like to have a, a space on the shelf, too, to just show the accomplishments to my, my student, too. Yeah, like, it feels good to see it. We've finished this year and then you know you you can throw it away but yeah like even that there's a little bit of a a lag in in our purging 
Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So what about, you know, a sorting strategy? So they yes. found their space, they understand their use case with respect to how they're going to homeschool or what type of limitations or factors go into how they're going to homeschool, which may affect how they choose their space. Mm -hmm. But what about, okay, now they've done that and now they're, now they've got all this material. It's sort of like the laundry has been dumped out onto the kitchen table now. Yeah. What now, do you do? now what do they do? Yeah. So you must have a sorting strategy. Um, without a strategy, uh, then everything is just going to be, it'll technically be on a bookshelf or in a bin somewhere, but you won't be able to find anything. So you know, usually this is either done by subject or by grade. So you would, you know, obviously if you're doing it by subject, all the math goes together, all the science goes together, all the reading goes together. Um, if so, so math and reading seem pretty, pretty, you know, that, that seems reasonable. But what about like the literature curriculums that have all these books too sometimes? Yeah, you know? so this is, this is complex. So, so those go, you have to decide if you're going to put those with the curriculum or if you're going to make a literature shelf yeah. where you keep all of your lit regardless of which curriculum it goes with yeah. right you know think of i'm thinking about the torch lights and build your libraries and yeah. blossom and roots where you've got all these books that you're going to work and, through and even within there you have kind of this weird grouping because sometimes you'll have children's books which very often we like to keep close to the children's rooms mm -hmm. or even on a shelf that they can pull off and look at themselves but then sometimes you have this these chapter books and where do the chapter books live? And it, it, it's weird because you got so many really options. complex. Yeah. So, so just, you know, initially subject or by grade, right? So you can yeah. group everything by subject, all your curriculum, or you can say, Hey, this is all of kindergarten. This is mm -hmm. all of first grade. I tend to go towards subject and here's why. If you go with grade, that works maybe okay in kinder, but as you go up, as we talked about earlier, you're going to have a kid who is operating at different levels, might be a third grader, but they're on right start uh, E and they're yeah. on all about reading two and they're all these things are not like lining up with the quote unquote grade level. So I think it's actually better to keep things by subject. I think that it's also easier to see you know, some things are hard to really put them in an exact grade. Uh, right Start's a good example. You know, we noticed right away with Right Start A that it was not just kindergarten. It went into first grade math as well. Yeah. Um, so I think it's easier to do it by subject, but that's just my personal opinion. So then you're talking about the books. The books is a great thing. It's not just books. It's also manipulatives and cards. There are things that go with curriculum. And how do you what do you want to do about those? So you can make a couple of decisions. Do you want to keep them all with the curriculum that they go with? And in the case of manipulatives and cards, maybe that makes sense. If the manipulatives or cards could fit on the bookshelf or in the bin that you'd plan to keep your curriculum in. Otherwise, you can have a section like a store, a section yeah. that's all manipulatives and is labeled according to what levels they go with um, or, you know, or what curriculum they go with. And maybe that works better for you. When it, in terms of books, my general feeling is for curriculum that is upcoming, books we haven't read yet, I would keep them with the curriculum. So for example, I'm planning Build Your Library 1 right now. I would keep Build Your Library 1 print out in a binder with all the books that I am collecting right now to prepare for it because there's no reason to put those in the children's rooms because we haven't read them yet so nobody is gonna care about that after we so get you don't done put them, you don't put them in the general circulation i wouldn't do that because we then, already have enough books that they can look at it's you know right. extra and i don't want to these 10 books are not something we want and we don't want to lose them into the i, I don't want to lose them black hole of, <laughs> right of, of but also children's. i don't want to I, I kind of want to keep them as a like a surprise yeah, it's you've, new right they're going like to be new and exciting the reveal yeah i want them to be new and exciting and engaging i don't be like oh yeah i've looked at all those pictures already <laughs> um so i try to keep them with the curriculum that i'm planning or the curriculum that is underway mm -hmm. so if we're working on something when we were working on torchlight k and bilge library zero we had all those books on a shelf together for the whole year because that's what we were actively working on. Yeah. Um, but it, it was nice because you did group them on the, on the shelf and, and like when we were doing the, uh, blossom and root, mm -hmm. um, section, we had like a shelf and a cubby and, and, and the it was the, all that it was all the books. So and, you knew where to go for the lit because yeah, it was all there. I, it may not have been easy to find them, but like, cause they're just picture books. They're thin. They're super thin. And this, but I was able to go know that they're here. They're right, like right here. And I, I, and they didn't go anywhere. And if my daughter, 
look through them a little bit. Like if she got into them, I'd just be like, okay, we got to put them back because daddy can't lose these. Right. And right? this is where I think with books, especially, this is the joy of washi tape. If no one's using washi tape yet, you are missing out. Washi tape is great. Um, we have an episode, we have an episode that Matt will link in the show notes called organize all the books mm -hmm. that goes into all kinds of details about how to organize books. So we're not going to do that here. Um, but washi tape, I just will mention very briefly is fantastic. It's a Japanese crafting tape, but it's, it peels right off of you, of the books. Kind of, like kind of a design color coding. Yeah, yeah. And there's all kinds of cool patterns on it. The only thing about it is it doesn't peel off if you buy cheap washi tape. So buy quality washi tape. I tend to always buy like 3M washi tape and that works pretty well. Don't buy just whatever brand because you want to make sure it's going to peel off your books and it's not going to cause damage to your books. So what I do is I choose a pattern design for every curriculum and all of the books get tagged with that same pattern design. The reason I like this is after we get done with the curriculum. So like right now we're done with um, Torchlight K and Build Your Library Zero. Now that we're finished, we're making this decision that or I haven't talked with you about this, but I'm thinking the decision should be that those books should go into the general circulation in the kids' rooms so that they can enjoy them because we've already read them. Mm -hmm. But in a few years, I am going to want to find them all again and collect them so that we can do this with our younger daughter. Yeah. But I don't want to like, um, I, I don't want to hoard them until that point i don't want to say like oh yeah. you can't look at these books because they're part of my curriculum whatever i don't want to put them in a bin or something and hide them away i want the kids to be able to enjoy them and if we want to read them again in the intervening three years we yeah. should be able to do that but the washi tape is going to tell me at, just at a glance across my kids bookshelves that's a book that goes to some sort of curriculum and i know the patterns well enough we don't have that many different you know, we only use this for the lit based curriculums. I don't have that many different patterns. I can tell just at a glance which level that goes with. Yeah, I agree. So I really like the washi tape. I think that's great. Um, that's the way that I organize books with curriculum. You may have a different, uh, you know, a different theory. You, you may decide that all the chapter books go in on one shelf. We were talking about this the other day of yeah. hoping, I was hoping we could get another shelf, another bookcase in our living room that I could just put read aloud chapter books on so that they were all there together, you know, where we could enjoy them anytime. Um, you have to think about like how you want to plan your books in your yeah. house. But so the same sorting methodology goes to the curriculum that people want to use as well. How, you know, do they use binders? Do they spiral bind them? Right. A lot of people love spiral binding their stuff. I'm a big binder person personally. Yeah. I love binders because they, you know, they're not very expensive. I can get, we get like 10 packs of Avery binders on Amazon or Amazon basics binders are fine too. And I like to get the ones with the clear window. Mm -hmm. uh, if you listen to our episode a few weeks ago about Canva, uh, I love to use Canva to do not only the cover of the binder, if the curriculum didn't have a cover, but also I do spine designs mm -hmm. and they're really easy to put together. Yeah. It's yeah. in right here, right? Yeah, right there. Yeah, they're in big blocky letters, so I can see right at a glance that yeah. that binder goes yes, with the that. Build your library, Antarctica, Africa. Like you're, you're yeah, I, when we did the Build Your Library like, Zero yeah, combo, yeah, in Torchlight K, I had like five binders because we combined the two curriculums. But I like the idea of putting it in a binder and putting a nice bold spine label on it. Labels are your friend when you use binders. Yeah. I don't. Personally, I don't prefer to spiral bind. I know a lot of people that love it. I don't prefer to do that because I can't take the pages out and copy them as easily if I wanted to make a copy. Or, you know, I need to replace a page because my yeah. toddler got in there with a Sharpie. Ask me how I know. And I need to print out another page from the, the PDF of Torchlight and put it in there. Yeah. I like to have that option. The other thing that's nice about putting things in a binder is if you decide that you want to insert something of your own, mm -hmm. like, oh, this is the Torchlight Pre-K and this week we're going to be studying about community helpers and you saw some activity on Pinterest about, you know, create your own fireman hat or something like that. You could just like print it off and slot it into the binder right there. I don't have to remember it later. I just put it in my binder. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... I'm a fan of binders, but people do things a lot of different ways. Um, but that really works for me. That works for my brain. So they've chosen a, sh a sorting strategy. They have their space. The first thing we want to do is get into 
the idea of preparation. It's one thing to like execute. Most people can execute a curriculum. They they have a you know a crate there or they have a, a roller and they're they're doing their <laughs> curriculums. But the really the hard work and I think you've already articulated it is the preparation work. Like that's one of the one of the keys to I think the success <laughs> of our homeschool has been the fact that you have done all this great preparation work. You're constantly out there looking for a new curriculum. You're constantly out there looking for the books. You're you're gathering up materials. You're organizing things. And so that when we finally get into that moment of saying, you know, when I like walk into the the office like I did today, I'm like, ah, oh, ugh, ugh, teacher need new curriculum. <laughs> you know, exactly like it was that. sort of like that. <laughs> you know, in so many words. Like, you got me to order right start this, C. So this, that's what we needed to do. This kid's smart. Daddy needs new curriculum. <laughs> yeah, and you went out and bought the right start C. So, you know, I'm like, hey, we're moving pretty fast. This kid's doing really good. Um, I need the next one because I'm going to be done probably in the next month and a half, right? That type of thing. So, you know, y- you do this great future work. You do this great future preparation. And then when when it becomes, when I, when I finally hit that moment where I'm like, I need the next curriculum, you're like, here it is. And, you know, what type of things can people do to begin to prepare and plan and sort for, you know, the long-term storage? Yeah. So <laughs> when it comes to, to preparing and planning, we, we think a few years ahead usually. I do this for a couple of reasons. One, because I I, I don't know that I could take not knowing what we're going to do next year. Just mm-hmm. personally, I'm, I'm not good with not having a plan. Yeah. Even if that plan will have to change later. I need to have a plan. So, you know, we're we're planning to move forward through the years with Build Your Library unless something t- changes. Um, and we find something that, you know, works better for our daughter or, or whatever. So I know the books that I need for levels ahead. Mm-hmm. So I do purchase those ahead of time when I see them at thrift usually um, or consignment sales. I try to get books where I can. I do have like a whole shelf of future books. They're not even the level that I'm currently planning. They're maybe a level or two or three ahead, but I know, oh yeah, we're going to read that. I'm going to pick that up. How how do you keep it in your mind? Like that's something that I would struggle with is just saying, you know, we're all really, you know, like if I'm, if I go thrifting, I know there's book series that I'm looking for, Mm -hmm. like certain authors or certain series and whatnot. And if I see it, I, you know, I'll pick it up. Um, Not as much as I used to, but (laughs) (laughs) I still do. But you know, when I'm looking for those books, how do you know, or how do you keep it in your mind what we need to have and, you know, what's coming up, like in the next two levels of build your library? Like what, do you have a a list on your phone? Do you have Excel sheets? Do you, you know, what does the project planner do? Yeah. So I love, I've done a couple of different things. Usually for the, the next level I'm planning, I have a Trello board that I'm you know, a checklist that I'm checking things off. And this is something you have on your phone. And yeah. Also, you know, because it's a web-based tool. The Trello and, app. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I do, uh, I do have other lists. I, I have some lists on Google drive and in the okay. Google drive sheets, which is like Excel, uh, where I do have lists for future, um, future levels. Honestly, I've looked at the next like two to three levels enough that I could probably recognize something and go, Hey, wait a minute. I think that sounds familiar because I've looked at them enough. Um, but yeah, I, I like to have mobile lists with me because when you're thrifting, you don't, you don't know what's coming up. You don't know what's going to come up. Um, I really find it best to study that list a little bit so that you're kind of familiar with, Mm -hmm. Um, what's on there because it's not like you're going to go thrifting and you're going to go, let me pull out my list of 50 books and see which one I need. I, I already have some level of familiarity. I've looked at them enough and I've, I've gone to Amazon and I've looked at each book. I'm, I've seen the covers before. So it's one of those things where as I'm thrifting, I'll stop on something and go, I don't know where that's from. But I know, I know that book. Yeah, Let me familiar, pull it. Yeah. That looks. There's something about that that title or that cover that that I think I've seen that. So, for me, that's how it works. It's it's not uh, super fancy, but that's how I do it. So I have a whole shelf or a couple of shelves actually where I keep 
future things. When stuff goes on sale and I buy stuff for the future, I keep it all there together. And it's a little bit of a hodgepodge. I'm not going to lie. It's got, it's got chapter books. You're looking back at the shelf right now in our office. It's got chapter books on it. There are some workbooks mixed in there that maybe don't have, yeah, there's some spines. There's some things that workbooks that don't have like a specific, uh, category that there might be something a little bit odd. They're not like just math or reading. They're like shapes or something different. Like, I, like the Star Wars shapes and colors books that I have over here? Yes. There was all the Star Wars workbooks that were all on sale at Book Outlet and I bought a bunch of them for uh, all these future years. So I have a shelf with a hodgepodge of future stuff that I just keep around and kind of know that it, that's coming up. So that's how I do that. The other long-term stuff, a lot of what I'm thinking about long-term so is, that's been finished. is stuff that's been finished yeah. that we're planning to pick up again. So this is where you want to make this something that you can find, especially because we as homeschoolers tend to um, either you know have people borrow curriculums or I, I've had a couple of moms come over just to look at my past curriculums and and look them over and see if that might be something they want to purchase. So I don't want these curriculums to be like something I cannot access anywhere. Uh, so I like to, you know, you want to put them somewhere that you know where they are, they're organized enough that they are accessible, but they're not readily accessible every day. You don't need them. You're not going to come back to them for a couple of years. I really like using the the bin idea for this personally because you can put a nice label on it and and say exactly what it is and it has enough space to hold the curriculum and the manipulatives or cards or whatever came with it all in one space when things are on a bookshelf little hands get to things and then they rearrange things that if you're not going to touch it for a while i like putting it in a bin same sorting methodology that you would have in your in use curriculum you would you would try to do the same thing in your long-term storage yeah like i would have a bin labeled math labeled right start math and i would yeah. put every level of right start math we finished in the bin and maybe and just hold on to it w- would you double up on things that you finished and things that are coming up i wouldn't know okay. the future stuff i like to keep out because i like to see where we're going because if i put it in long-term storage then you're going to come in and say oh i need the next level of right start and I will forget completely that I already bought it. So (laughs) I need to have the stuff that's future there on the shelf that I can clearly see this is what I have. Otherwise, I will duplicate by ask me how I know. (laughs) And um, so I that for me, this works for me. Hey, if if this isn't your problem, then that's cool. But I do like to to I like to think to put things in bins. I like to label them. And I love for those bins or storage containers to be clear because then you can not only is it labeled but you can see into it and you know confirm that that's actually what's in there <laughs> so and like oh yeah you know that's where those books are so there's lots of great rubbermaid type storage containers sterilite storage containers you can get and i i like those personally they work for me other people really like crates it depends i think what the form factor of your Space. Your curriculum yeah, is, is yeah. and if you've got crates too, and you have things in binders, you can put the binders with the spine side up, and then they just fit beautifully in Everywhere. crates where you can just yeah. see them all the way along. Pull and it out and look what's pull, inside. Yeah, pick forever. right through them. Yeah, so that um, works out really nice. Quick question: as 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 somebody who is, you know, on the outside looking in to this magical organization and planning person that you are. Um, Say somebody has like a consumable curriculum, like for example, I'm thinking like all about reading, where you're actually using the workbook, you're cutting mm-hmm. things out and whatever. So you've they've completed this curriculum, they're listening to you, they're going, ah, oh, here's my long term storage area that I'm going to put this away. Do you say immediately buy the replacement book, so that when you, you know, in the next week when it comes in, or if you download it digitally and you print it off, do you replace those pages immediately or replace that book immediately? If it's a consumable, like some of these books, like Mm -hmm. Right Start has consumable worksheets. All About Reading has consumable pages that are cut out. Would you advise people to immediately replace those consumables and just, okay, you just wait? I would not do it. I would not do it for a couple of reasons. But don't throw away the book because you lose the reminder of the activity or the worksheet book. 
Uh, no, or no. Just, when you pull it out, you got to reset the whole curriculum. So, okay, here's a reason. There's a couple of reasons I would not pre-buy and to set yourself up for the future. There's a couple of things. One, they come out with new editions, mm-hmm. and you may decide you really want that new edition for X, Y, Z reason, and then you've already spent money on a workbook that you're not going to use. Good point. Two, that next child, as much as you think that they're going to use that same curriculum, you may find that is a terrible fit for that kid, and then you've already spent that money on the workbook. So I absolutely wouldn't do that. Okay. What you can do is put a sticky note right on the front cover of the curriculum or right inside the front cover that says need to purchase workbook. Mm-hmm. And then you can do that. If you're if you fear for some reason that the consumable won't be available, like the company's going to go out of business, then you know maybe buy it. But otherwise, I would not buy it until you need it because you really don't know if you're going to need it. It's just like best laid plans. You hope that you will. Yeah. The big thing about consumables, and if you haven't started homeschooling yet, really think about this. How can I save the consumables? So, you know, that doesn't always work. Some consumables you have to write in. Others you don't. And I'll give a great example here with All About Reading. We did All About Reading Level 1, and we had the consumable student workbook, and we're planning to use this for two children. And we went ahead and every page you cut oh, it I out. Butchered, and butchered you, that you took. It, it was all that. like activities where you would cut out different words oh, and yeah. then you would place them on, you know, different. It was like a print and cut. Print and cut and manipulate with things, right? Yeah. And then every time you threw them away, threw them away, threw them away. It shocked everyone. So <laughs> we didn't have, at the end of it, that workbook was completely consumable. And then we bought level two from another mom who had already used it and she did a binder she's an with, expert level oh yeah she did a binder with the consumables when she when she cut them out she slipped them into a slick sheet in a three ring binder and the first half of it is is uh this way up and the second half of it is the other way so that the that it didn't get too big so she yeah. evened out where the the groups but, of but manipulatives things, were sitting like a lot of the things you have to cut like they'd be like for example uh compound words right so they'd have bob cat and those would be cut those would be cutouts mm-hmm. and then you have to then move them around she actually collected all of those and put those into the right. The so they're in the so slick sheet. They're all there, cut out, ready for you to use. It's great. It's, and it's a dream. <laughs> I think that that system not only is it great to save to use with your next kid. It's really cool the first time you use it because you don't have to stop in the middle of a lesson and go. Let me go ahead and cut this out for you, honey. Oh my god! It's already pre-cut and ready. So if you I can't ha- tell you how much time I spent. Like while we were doing mm-hmm. the warm up exercises, I'm sitting here with a pair of scissors just preparing the activity that totally. I knew was totally. And so if you if you're doing all about reading, I highly recommend that you cut those puppies out and put them in slick sheets in a three ring binder, and then you can use them again, or you can sell the curriculum and then look, you have this. There's other work worksheets like uh, Right Start Math, for example. That's not as easy with that. You you would they're meant to be written in. You can get away with putting those you know, go ahead and take all that worksheets and, and put it in a binder. And when you're going to do it, you can take it out and you can put it in a sheet protector and then have your child do everything in whiteboard marker and wipe it off and then put it back. That is also a totally cool way to go. Um, but think about those workbooks and how you could make them last if you want them to, because, uh, I mean, sometimes they're not super expensive, but you know, that's like an extra 30 bucks or something a year you have to spend to get another workbook. And yeah. at the rate we're moving through math, I mean, it, it would add up. We just bought Right Start B a few months ago, and now I already had to buy C because we're not that far away from going through it because our kids eat math alive. But, yeah. you know, it's it's nice if you can find a way to reuse that. I love, one of the things I love about Right Start is they offered... It was 10 bucks more when you bought it, but you could get e-worksheets so you could print them for each child. It's worth it. I like that for a couple of reasons. I love that we can use them for two children. I also like that if she was doing an exercise and got frustrated with it or whatever, we could always just print another copy and she could do it again. You know, if it didn't make sense or if we wanted to star a few pages and say, well, those exercises were particularly hard for her. I might print them out in the future and have her like review with those. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of a cool way to go too. Okay. So we talked about, you know, preparation for future curriculums, also long-term storage for curriculums that people have just finished. What about how they, all the curriculum and all the activities that are in use, like these are the things we are currently doing or very near to do. Right. You know, it's like right on the horizon. Yep. What are 
what can people do with respect to organizing for that? Location, location, location. Yeah. I think it's best to keep your curriculum close to where you're going to work. It's really hard if you work all over the house, <laughs> which, you know, we it's don't not, know anything about that. Yeah. Uh, but pick a spot for your curriculum and try to keep it close to where you work. We have a homeschool room. We don't use our homeschool room all that often because we have a little one and she's still kind of chaotic. We can't kind of corral her yet into one space. I have dreams we're going to use it someday. But we started off keeping our curriculum up there and then we realized, you know, we just need to keep our curriculum near the kitchen because that's where most of the work is actually done. And otherwise, you have to keep hauling back and forth. Like, I got to run upstairs and figure out the lesson so I can go downstairs. And it's just, it doesn't work very successfully. So... Um, and, and we still do that with a couple of our pieces and I'm trying to figure out how we can find space near the kitchen to move them because it, it isn't fun to have your curriculum far away. So find a good spot that's I close tried, to where I you're I tried doing that because with like the right start, I kept it upstairs and yeah, because as an abacus has all the, the manipulatives, manipulatives yeah. and, the, and the worksheets and everything and, and it just lives up there. And I have finally started to just like, it's now living in the morning basket. <laughs> it's funny how when you get into the homeschooling you have all these visions and everything sort of like the mike tyson thing everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face and you know it feels like when you go into homeschooling you have this great plan and then all of a sudden you just go that's just not working this is what really works this is what makes it easy this is what greases the skids this is what helps us do the things we need to do in an effective manner and i found that you know just having those materials downstairs on the crate right by the kitchen table it just makes it easy for me yeah. and and you're gonna find those those you know, little wonky solutions um, because that's specific to your your home or your family or the needs that you, you have. You're going to find that this really just has to be this way because this is really what works for us in this, you know, in, in, right. in the state we're at. For example, if you got a young kid, you want to stay close. Like if, if, you know, when our when our youngest is maybe another year old, I think we're going to be in the homeschool room. Yeah, I do yeah. too. And, and that's the thing too. This system's going to change. Very potentially so don't think about like yeah. permanently affixing things to the walls necessarily <laughs> especially if you have little ones because it is going to grow and change but putting your in use stuff close to you i think is very important um books that you're going to read as part of the curriculum mm -hmm. or books that you've just read that your kids might want to go back through put them someplace that's accessible to you again you don't want to go digging through everything we put all of the books we were reading for torchlight and build your library this last year all in our living room bookshelves because they're very close to the kitchen and the couch yep. where we would do our reading. It, it just works because like, okay, this week I need this book, this book, this book, or I have these spines. If you have a chance, I think by the time this goes out, we're going to start dropping some of our YouTube videos where we talk about the spines on yep. the Build Your Library and the Torchlight Combo. Mm -hmm. Definitely check out the YouTube videos on that. Um, but a lot of times we'll have these spines that we got to pull off the wall. And we had a lot of alternate spines. We'll have a video on that one maybe in a couple of weeks as well. Um, that will, you know, we, we've got to pull off and I got to put them in the crate for that week. Right. right. And, and we used this crate system yeah. for us. This worked really well. We had a crate that you could basically load up with what we were doing for the week. Yeah. And then you could move through it almost in, you know, front to back type order. And you knew when you reached the back of the crate, you were done. You I, had read funny. everything. I had a couple systems where I had the binder for the week like the binder that uh, talked about the curriculum and that was my spacer. So everything right. behind the, the binder yep. had been read. And so we just, I just constantly, and we would put all our library books, library in the books crate. Going there and everything, everything yeah. would go in the crate. And that was the way that we kind of did, you know, so we didn't have to use a checklist. So, you know, find what works for you. You could do a rolling cart. Maybe it's a bookshelf. Um, find a way that you can gather your materials that you're going to need for whatever period of time, if it's a week or two weeks or whatever you want, or just the day, Find a way that you can coalesce that that works for you. Uh, the crate system worked well for us. Yeah, we had two. We had basically three crates. Um, one for the active homeschool stuff for that week. All the literature, all the spines, all the all the homeschool materials. If it was like whatever, um, and then I had a morning basket which had a bunch of mm -hmm. materials in it, and then I had a second morning basket for my my youngest. So yeah, and we, we have, have a crate for ELA yeah. and we have a crate for math. And yep, and, and those the, are upstairs. Yep, yeah, and the crates for ELA and math. The way that we did those was we put. The main curriculum, so it's okay, all about reading, but then we would also put some reading games in there and some other reading practice yep. and some early readers. And same thing for math. We put some card games in there and some other math facts Fla practice. Flashcards, and, paper, pencils, right. things that I know I, I tend to need. And the, like a, we have a shelf above that has like 
basic office supplies like uh, scissors and pencils and you know more manipulatives and paper yeah. and, and those type of things glue glue sticks things of that nature are up there as well because i tend to need to get those really quick and i want to have those close by so i don't have to go hunt and, right. and seek and, and, do and the nice things. thing about having crates with multiple things in them for us we did like with math and and, and uh, ELA, we were able to choose different things for our daughter to do. So we didn't have to do like the same curriculum every day. And mm-hmm. we had all of our stuff kind of coalesced in a crate. So, you know, that worked for us right now. And it was portable. So we could say, you know, oh, our three-year-old is really wanting to play in the living room right now. So we're going to work at the dining room table instead of the kitchen table. We can just take our crate and move it into that room. It worked great for us. But maybe you've got a rolling cart system or something else that will work well for you. Um, so I think it's, it's important to figure out, you know, how you're going to store the, how you're going to store it and then how you're going to organize. Are you going to keep all your curriculum together for all your kids? Are you going to separate it by child? Um, are your children old enough that they're going to be pulling the curriculum themselves? So, oh, you've got worksheet pages for all your kids and they're old enough to work mostly independently with some assistance. Maybe you want to do like, like a crate with hanging files and each hanging file is for a different kid. You could do color coded folders Mm -hmm. for each kid and say, oh, you know, it's week one and I've got a folder in red and a folder in blue and a folder in green. Those are my three kids. And this is all the worksheets they need to do for week one. They can come in, they can pull their, their color coded folder, you know, I, they're all the green folders or whatever, and they can start on their worksheets and, and maybe there's a checklist in there for them. And this is how they can get all their stuff done. You could do something like that. If you have older kids, um, just kind of think or, about or maybe it even lives that that crate lives in their room and they, they wake up in the morning and maybe they so. can start, they can get working. Right. Whatever, whatever works for them. You just need to kind of decide if you're going to, if you're going to separate by kid or keep everything together, find may, you might need to try a few systems. That's another thing to yeah, right. find what works for you. We didn't do the crate system at first. We were doing a bookshelf system. It didn't work for us. Work. So we had to change it. So you might have to try a few things on for size. I love to like scroll through uh, pictures on Google images or something and see different homeschool organization. I'm like, Oh, that kind of works with my brain. There's a bunch of ways to organize things. Yeah, right. What about checklists? Like sometimes maybe, um, if you have some autonomous and, you know, yeah, uh, learners that can go off and do their own thing, whether it's workbooks, maybe you buy an all in one curriculum and they're just moving through things. Yeah. How, how do you as a parent, you know, track those things? Because I know with the younger learners, like with the kindergarten, first grade, second grade, you know, you're intimately involved in the education. Right. So you, you basically know what they're doing. Yep. But once they start doing l- things on their own, when they get a little bit older, how do you track that work? You know, like... So I mean, there's, a, that, there's right? a few things that you can do. You can either do a checklist that they check off. You that's that's just a slip of paper you print. You can also have do some reverse planning where your kid just tells you what they did for that week. And that's kind of something we used to do with our monthly reports to our parent partnership. Yeah, we would like, just say this is what we did. This is what we did. We didn't plan forward. We reverse planned, which was really nice because you could just say this is what I got done. Um, you can have a have a checklist for your kids on Trello. You can have it on Google Drive, and they go on there. You you can have a whiteboard where every kid has to check off that they did each subject every day. It can look however it works for your family. Checklists can be really nice. Um, those are for checklists your kids would do. If you want to do a checklist for yourself, you can decide how to put that together. Maybe you have like a a weekly plan that just includes the major subjects and you fill in in those blocks of you know math and you're like, yeah, I want to do three right start lessons this week. And, you know, that's your goal every week is to hit three of them and you can put little check boxes for yourself. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's nice to put those, if you're going to do the same thing week after week, it's nice to put those into a, like a a dry erase protector sheet, because then you can just write on it, wipe it off in the next week. You, you know, yep. I did. How how am I doing towards my, um, towards the lessons I want to accomplish this week? So there's lots of good ways, both, you know, digital and hard copy to do checklists. So that's books and curriculum. Um, what about manipulatives and cards? I know in like an all about reading, there's a lot of flashcards, manipulatives and oh, right start so, math. There's so many different. So many manipulatives yeah. and right start math. So here's the thing. Every manipulative or card set needs a storage container. I can't say this strongly enough. Whether they, it's a Ziploc bag or... Doesn't matter what it is. Tupperware. You have to have something to store this stuff in. You can't just say like, oh, this is the pile of cards. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, even just a rubber band around those cards, yeah. 
those cards go missing so fast. Yeah. <laughs> so everything needs a, a, a some sort of a storage, uh, you know, box, bin, bag, something, and a place for that item to go. Like, for example. So everyone knows where it lives. Yeah, like the tiles on my Right Start Math. I took them down today and I'm doing the early preschool curriculum with my three-year-old and I pulled out all the tiles from Right Start Math because there's the yellow, I think they're yellow, green, and red. And I opened up the tin and I poured them out and I said, hey, let's sort these by color. And she's looking at them and she starts sorting them and there's like four yellows and there's like 20 greens and 20 reds. And she's like, Daddy, there's something wrong. There's not enough yellow. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know, That's kid. because they went missing before because, we got a storage well, that container. That was because I had them in these little tins up on the top of our shelf. And I would just pull them and then they, would, I, they wouldn't go back in the right spot. And now I have a clamshell casing for all the tiles and I don't lose tiles anymore. Exactly. This is like all about reading and you had all the little magnets. And so we had a board. And I lost one of the S's. So now I had to make like my own. <laughs> yeah. We had a board on the wall with the magnets. I thought that this was safe. This was not no, safe. Terrible idea. I was, I was, I was not smart. I needed to have a bag or a bin to put those tiles away well, when you're done with the all about really reading nice, lesson. So they're magnetized tiles They in all about reading. We're using our curriculum as a specific thing, but this applies to almost any other curriculum yeah, out there. Yeah. So you're, you got your little tile and has a little magnet on the back so you can put them up on a, a grease board. I had them on a, like a magnetized dry erase board and it was great. Like you could slide them around. It was white. Sure. You could write it. They were also words. super easy for a toddler to get to. Well, yeah, exactly. <sighs> and so I needed to have a small enough thing where I could slide it in while with all the tiles still magnetized that I could zip it up and put it away because yeah, that got raided all the time. I would be walking in going... Why are all the all about reading tiles? Yeah, on the, the floor? toddler would climb up on the chair, climb up on the table, on and the table reach and up to the whiteboard and get those. So, the other thing about she like zeroed in on the one thing she could not touch. Right. Here's a room for of all <laughs> toys and books for you to look. She goes, "No, Dad, see that thing up on the corner? Yeah, that's the thing I want. It's not a spider. No, that's an all about reading tile <laughs> that I need to get. <laughs> so <laughs> I need to put it in my so mouth. So when you're yeah right. When you're when you're figuring out how you're going to store all these manipulatives and cards and things, one thing that I think is helpful is try to try to store them in small enough containers yeah. that you're not mixing different things. I love these. There's these great like you need, you need the bento box for your uh, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> there's these great these great photo storage boxes from Michaels and they sell them on Amazon. I'll, I'll we'll link some in the show notes. That's what we bought for our right start math manipulatives because we were able to label them and put them all in their own containers it really try not to group them so much that you can't you can't find things even with the like all about reading cards the the one we bought from that other mom yeah. she had broken them into ziploc baggies and she had broken them up by when they were used the in the lessons. lesson by the yeah. lesson so he could just pull out like this block of cards is just the next you know but then, Five but then there's lessons. a lot of review, and so we bought the the containers from All About Reading. Yeah, those so are work really well yeah. because those All About Reading cards are not like standard notebook, not standard okay. index card size. They, so buying they, the boxes is actually yeah. really helpful. The, buying the box extends the life of those cards. Right, and you can buy the boxes just themselves at Rainbow Resource, just so you know. Because <laughs> when you buy All About Reading, you have to like buy the deluxe pack to get the box, and it comes with like a tote bag and stuff. I do not need the tote bag. I do need that box. Ariel, so tell tell these tell these fine wonderful beautiful human beings who are going out to itunes and leaving us a wonderful five-star review why they need a label maker oh my gosh you guys you have to have a label maker it is the, the greatest thing in the world <laughs> this is the way Husband. this is the way that i Dog. keep everything organized <laughs> and to to print out a label and stick it onto a tub and be like yep that's all this curriculum or that's all these manipulatives or the photo storage container yep these are the tiles for right start these are the popsicle sticks these are the this i mean it's yep. like you labeling stuff is so helpful and even if you have like a like sometimes we have some storage bins in, in one of our closets you know they're just like a tub of manipulatives mm -hmm. for like right start because there's things in the right the they're, right start they're that, too big they're too big or they're or like to go in the we don't need them for another two two years yes yeah, so we haven't even and opened it's them. like you have just a tote and it just says on the outside you know right start you know manipulatives you know that type of thing right yeah and you can say like these are the manipulatives that are in here and the label makers are pretty cheap yeah. uh, we'll put one in the show notes that's a good the one we have and the label makers are pretty cheap and the tape is pretty cheap it they're just 
they're really good. Get a label maker. It's important. Um, and, and the last thing is there needs to be a designated space to put all of these manipulatives away. It's one thing to put them in a storage bin, but you got to have somewhere to put them that, that, that you and the kids and everybody knows this is where these go, go away because mm-hmm. I, every, I'm really a big believer in everything has a place, everything in its place. But, but like a lot <sighs> of times place for everything, everything in its place. That's when you're doing is. these curriculums, you need them back fast. So like even, for example, we have a table upstairs where I have um, all the active materials, a lot of the reading books that we're doing, the right start, the all about reading stuff. Um, I tuck the manipulatives away in their tins, like up against mm-hmm. the wall, stack them. And I know they're right there because, they, you know, oh, right now we're doing geo boards or right now we're doing, you know, this or that. And, and I need to have access to them immediately. But then also we have shelves above that have like additional card games, additional Uno, you know, whatever, car, you know, cards or other manipulatives we need. You know, you may have like multiple little spaces, but you want to be able to put them away so you can get to them immediately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were talking with somebody who had like a math cart. I think that's a yeah. great idea where you have you know, all yeah. the different manipulatives. They've got a spot on the cart and their little containers. It's... It's the way to go. I tell you. Because this stuff gets lost so easily, those little manipulatives. Because they, they're yeah. manipulatives. The kids like to play with them. They like to get them out and they like to mess with them. And it's just... Death it's by a thousand cuts. Yes. Your own And that right start set is expensive enough. Personal homeschool you know? uh, yeah. purgatory is constantly having to go and hunt for things you need. Oh, like, yeah. Like I, what a waste. I, there, was a time, there was a time where I was so poorly organized that I just quit and I went and grabbed you know i was at the store i grabbed like a bunch of five by three three by five index cards because like i'm just tired of hunting for everything if they ask me for some cards i'm just going to quickly make them right like i just get so tired of hunting for things and it's just a death by a thousand cuts so organize 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 it really helps you you know alleviate a lot of that stress of like wasting time and and i'm a big i hate wasting I, I, I'm fine spending time doing the things you need to do, but I hate doing repetitive tasks that can be optimized away. Yeah. That's right. True. If you're constantly spending 10 minutes a day hunting for things and you do that all week long, you lost an hour. And you, by the end of the week, by the end of the year, you've lost 52 hours. You've wasted two whole days hunting for things. And you're just like, it's, it's death by a thousand cuts. So, Try to optimize a way that, that chronic pain of finding things and hiding things and things being stolen and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So let's talk, a, we talked about physical, we talked about all the various elements of like what they would do in in use curriculums. Let's talk a little bit about the digital curriculums and how yeah. they want to organize these things. Okay, so it's really important that you have a good system for the digital stuff, right? We use a lot of digital curriculums, Bossman Root, Torchlight, Build Your Library. Uh, build your library. Even, uh, we use the Right like Start Math worksheets. Explode the Code or some other curriculums that you can actually buy digital versions of those Right, there's lots of them that, you know, they sell physical books, but there's also a digital version. Um, the Right Start Worksheet's a great example. Great example uh, there's, there's lots of like education.com, workbooks or things you get on teachers pay teachers oh, yeah. that you picked up free unit studies i mean you name it like the the sky's the limit there's a lot of digital resources out there if uh, speaking you, of digital resources head down to the show notes and check out our gumroad page if you're looking for resources for your around the world journeys go ariel Ooh, what a fast plug so so this, this is not an ad <laughs> all, offer for free y'all yeah. um so uh so if you are storing your digital curriculums or your digital resources. Let's come, I'm just going to call them digital resources because it can be a lot of things. If you are storing these on your hard drive, on your shame, 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 shame. You have to store these somewhere in the, if you're cloud. in the cloud. If your computer dies, do not lose all your curriculum. No. Please, for the love of Pete, do not do that. Well, especially since there's so many free options out there that have really large storage capability. Oh my gosh, yes. Google Drive is a great example. So we use Google Drive. You can use Google Drive. You can use Dropbox. There's a number of different solutions. I like Google Drive. Um, I like it because I have Drive as an app on my phone. Mm-hmm. So it's great. I have everything stored. We're reading our show notes off of our off Google, of Google Drive. Drive. Yes, <laughs> Google Drive is great. Um, one of the things, so the way that I organize it, I have a folder on there and it contains everything for our kids. Just all of it for the kids. And inside that I have a folder for both of our daughters with their names on it. Um, the inside those folders, I have things by, 
uh, by grade ish level, or you could do it by age, whatever you prefer. And so I have like baby, I have their, I have their birth certificates there. I have their vax records. I have all their stuff there. Right. And then I have preschool and I have all of the things I've got some work examples. I've got some, um, you know, their school pictures, just I, whatever it is, I have all these things kind of that I'm building this record and anything our daughter does digitally for the last, her kindergarten year, I just threw it in the digital folder for kindergarten. So I have a whole bunch of things of reports we had to do of the work that she was doing for a parent partnership. Worksheets that her, her teacher gave us to do. And right. Things, things Anything that was digitized, I put it in there. So we like to take, you know, you can take pictures of your kid's art so you don't have to keep a million pieces of art. And then I throw them in the folders. So I have those for both of our girls and that just serves as a record for us of everything that we needed well, it, for those it, years. And that's super powerful because if you're at the school and the person says, I need this piece of information you just pull up your phone you got google drive right there you navigate right to the thing and you open the file and you show it yeah i really like that um and it's a good way if you like to digitize your kids work or if your kids done a book report or a presentation or something and it's all digital you have a place to store it that you're not going to lose it so that's great so i have those two folders for both of our girls and then i have a third folder that says homeschool and in that i have all of my different curriculum um i have mine organized by subject because as in physical, I also believe digitally that subject is probably the best way to go. So I have like all in ones and inside there I've got Blossom and Root and Village Library and Torchlight um, and playing preschool, which we have as well. And then I have a different folder called math and it's got right start in it and it has um, math digital math right. mammoth. And the next one is ELA and I've got a subfolders for handwriting and for phonics. And this is where I keep everything and it's all organized for me. Whenever there's an update sent out from one of the curriculum creators, I can go ahead and put it in there and obsolete the other curriculum. It's it's so easy. Everything is organized and it's all I'm I'm able to find everything. We are I'm much more digitally organized than I'm physically organized. <laughs> um, but I would hate for anybody to store something on their desktop and lose it because some of these, like Right Start's a good example as I just bought the worksheets today for level C and I down did the digital download and I put it on drive so that we would not lose it. Um, you only get one download of that. So if you downloaded it to your, to your hard drive and then it died, you're up, you know, you're, you got to just do it again. I mean, it's, it was just a waste. So really think about how you can secure your data digitally mm -hmm. when it comes to homeschool curriculums, because that, that is a, a big curation of, of content there that you're going to need. Yeah. And don't, and don't, don't hit us with the emails and say, no, 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 Matt, Ariel, I back up my computer to my external hard drive. It's absolutely fine. It automatically happens. Hey, hey. No. You you do you if you're going to back it up. No, but I'll tell don't you, say we didn't warn I'll tell you. I'll the story. I had a, a writer friend who did exactly that and her hard drive fell off the back of her her uh her desk and she she didn't know where it went. And she lost it. She thought she lost all her books. And she was starting to prepare for the apocalypse of, you know, rewriting things or yeah, But how do you not notice that your hard drive fell behind your desk? Those are the type of things that happen. When you don't use a cloud, I'm more worried use about the cloud. I'm more worried about something being corrupted. The yeah. other thing that I really like about having the curriculum in the cloud is that I can pull it up on my phone. I can take a screenshot of it, and I can text that to Grandma when our kids are going to stay with Grandma for a couple of days. And like, do hey, this. will you do this? Will you do this reading yeah. exercise with her? Uh, and I have it right on my phone. So I really like that. It's it's nice as well. Uh, depending on where we're at and what we're doing. This is another way that I can check on what books I need. If I didn't have a list, Bingo. I could always go and look at the curriculum. Oh, I don't remember if that was in there. Oh, yeah, yeah here it is. Absolutely, so. yeah. G get into the cloud as soon as possible. It, it just, I think it eases a lot of pain. I know it's a little bit of work, but it's, it, I think the benefits outweigh it's worth the, it. The, the, the other work. So that was talking about, you know, storing things in digital format. We have some other thoughts as we close out here, it's a little bit of a longer podcast, but I think this is a really important one. This won't go up with like buy all the books, organize all the books, organize organization your is so important. Organizing, yeah. Or and I'd love to hear how you all organize oh, yes, your systems because I, I really, I like in another life. I think I could have been a home organizer. I'm not good about it in my own life, <laughs> Recondo, but but I really like I really like the concept, and I'd love to hear. I love to hear how other people organize oh, stuff. I, I want to hear the first person say that we use carrier pigeons, Matt. I I just want to hear how you all organize. So we talked. Uh, so some other thoughts we had. 
Uh, we talked about washi tape. You can also color code. You could also yeah. use like colored dots, dots. for yeah, I've seen the you dots. could use for different subjects. I've, se- I've or, seen a lot of the teachers using dots. Yeah, you can use dots. Yeah. I'm I'm personally not a huge fan of dots because they don't always peel off really easily or they're mm-hmm. so cheap that they fall off. So either way, I'm not like a great fan. But you're a dot you know, hater because maybe buy nice dots. I don't because know if there's nice dots. Y- you've spent so many so many hours of your life peeling off a goodwill tape, you know, uh little you know, price tags. Oh man, so many. So, um, so the other thing is figure out a loaner system, whatever mm-hmm. system works for you. Yeah, we're currently Chances, doing this. We're loaning a couple of curriculums to friends. Right, who who are evaluating them to see if they want to purchase yeah. them, right? Um, so figure out a system that works for you. Uh, chances are that you may, somebody may borrow your curriculum and you want to know who, who has it and like when they're going to return it. And uh, you may be borrowing somebody else's curriculum because oh, they're not at that level right now and your kid's at a lower level than them, but maybe they're going to be coming back around to that. It's good to notate when you need to return that curriculum by (laughs) so that you can make sure that you get through it before they need it again if that's what you're doing. So um, yeah, I know that that's common, but figure out what your system's going to be for, for loan. And when we're talking about organizing as well, Think about where the things you have borrowed will go and not putting them in with your general population, whether it's a curriculum that you've borrowed or books you've checked out from the library or whatever. Think about like having a dedicated space for things that are not ours. (laughs) Yeah, like the library, library books is a great example. Like that's something that goes into our curriculum thing. I don't like those books going onto the couch for free reading. If they do, they need to come right back because... Last thing you want to do is, you know, you're already a heavy user of the library. You're already right up against the limit. They already give you the evil eye when you <laughs> walk in there. It's like, who is this person who keeps checking out these many books? You know, you don't want to. You don't want to get on the bad side, especially when you can't return a book and you say, "I start paying for them." I literally. They <laughs> said the, evil, the nasty, nasty gram. They said we had a movie, and I was like. I was calling shenanigans on it because I was like, we don't have this. I've looked all over this house. We don't have this movie. It turned out that we had packed it away with our (laughs) holiday movies and it was in the closet. So we actually did have it. And thankfully I was able to return it before they charged me. But just, you know, (laughs) keeping them segregated is really important. Um, The other thing I want to talk about, uh, just some other thoughts is uh, thinking about how you want to record your child's work. Mm -hmm. whether you want to uh, take pictures of all of it and put it digitally or uh, whether you want to store physical samples. What I do, I have some big, they're kind of like one foot by one foot uh, file boxes and they have the lid that opens up and then inside you can put hanging file folders. Are they upstairs? Yep. They're the ones upstairs. Um, And I have one box for each child. I have their name on the front of the box. And in those I have hanging file folders. I have the first one's for uh, health records so that when I go to doctor's appointments and things, I just throw them in there and I have them, uh, they have vaccination stuff, everything is in there. And then I have made a hanging file folder for every grade for both girls. Mm -hmm. And this is the place where I just, I don't have to think about it. I just toss stuff in. And then when I get to the end of the year or even halfway through the year, depending on how thick that is, I go through and I cull stuff because it might be that you put something in there for handwriting, let's say, and then a month later, there's like a better example of that. And, you know, this happens with art sometimes too, like, oh, that was really great. But when I look back through the whole year's art, maybe the one I want to save is different now that I can see all of the art together. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, these are the standout pieces that I really want to keep, or these are the standout work products I want to keep. So Um, and then I plan to keep those for the duration, uh, and you can, you know, depend on, on how, how much you want to save and how big, but think about what you want to do. And I think hanging file folders by age or whatever, however you want to do that is a great way to go because then you can have the physical, um, the physical record of your child's progress. You can also digitize all that stuff. If you want to, you can just scan everything in and then throw it in a folder and you don't have to keep any of those records. It'd be great for people who have like tiny houses and don't, you know, don't have enough room to store things, but yeah. think about what system you want to use to store either physically or digitally records for your kids. Absolutely. So this was a little bit of a longer podcast, but I think it's really, really important to talk about this. We hope we give you some yeah, good ideas. We got some really good ideas. I think we talked a little bit about some of our experiences and, and how, you know, you may have similar experiences, how you, you know, moved here or moved there, or you've had to change and tweak and 
this is a constantly evolving thing. This is not something that's static with, with your homeschool. Now it might be static in the fact that, okay, this is our room where we do all our homeschooling and there are no excuses that we, we homeschool here, but you know, some of the, you know, the micro nuance that you, you do may have to change over time, especially in how, you know, your homeschool room kind of evolves over time with how many, you know, kids you have in there and what curriculums they're doing and how, you know, independent they are and, right. and, and how self-sufficient they are because the, things may move around, things may change. So really, really powerful. Thank you for putting all this together. This is really sure. just like kind of a distillation of, you know, what we always do. And, and it's, I, I think it's, it's very illuminating and very helpful. Let's end it the way we always do it, what we're into. I have been at the YMCA pool for seven, no, 10 straight days. Yeah. 10 straight days. Both our kids are in swim lessons. Swim lessons. <laughs> swim lessons is all we're doing right I now. I call it the fire engine drill because I got to get them up, got to get them fed, got to get them out. Man, how do these public school people do? Uh, yeah. Get their kids out of the school. It's, they're out the school standing out there at 730. What are they doing? I can't get these kids out by eight o'clock. So I got to get them up, got to get them fed, got to yeah. get them out. First lesson's not even until 9, 10 and it's really hard to it's get the kids It's still pretty up. hard. That you know, I'm I'm complaining. It's all right. I'm allowed to because I'm a homeschool parent. I'm allowed to complain a little. Um, but man, it's a fire engine drill. I gotta get one into the child gear. Yeah. Gotta get the other one into the thing. Gotta get them changed. Get them into the pool. Okay, ah, sit there for thirty minutes. Make sure they don't drown. Get them out. Get them all dried off. Run them back into the play care. Get the other one out of play I'll tell care. Tell you what, get though. them all dressed. Get them put them back in. It has been a fire engine drill, but it's been very very good. I've, it's been really good for a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, the swim lessons tire them out. Oh my if you God. can sign up for morning swim lessons in the summer, it's pretty fantastic <laughs> but because, because we homeschool year round, but man, I tell you what, that 130 homeschool. No, so we had to start with a kid who is gassed. We had to start homeschooling right awful, when they got home from swim awful. lessons. Yeah, we had to start homeschooling right when they got home I'm from yelling in her general direction. <laughs> awful. <laughs> we we started we moved the homeschool up. We usually you usually do it in the afternoon and yeah, we had to move it up into the morning up. because uh by she the afternoon like out of steam. our younger child is absolutely napping early. <laughs> our older child is just kind of curled up on the couch with an audiobook. <laughs> there's a lot of quiet time going on. <laughs> so <clears throat> swim you, lessons. There's something we recommend Men. There's something about the pool that just, I mean, I, I, I know what it is. It's because it's the temperature regulation and your body is really working to keep its temperature up. But my God, does it suck the absolute life out of you. They they are so tired. One of the cool things that we learned through this a swim lesson um, is that the our YMCA has a swim team and yours may as well. Yeah. And the swim team is starts at five years old. So I had no idea we could join a swim team that early, but you might check in that check into that if you have a local yeah. Our daughter's y. really getting into it and she's actually kind of interested. In, so she's really practicing right, right but now. It's in really our, dominated. In our 12 foot in tech, a uh, 30 inch depth pool. Just, just, yeah. just deep enough that Mr. Matt can sit in the pool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's pretty much dominated our life lately. Yeah. Well, and, 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 swim lessons. And what did you do to me? You sign me up for the next cycle. I'm going to spend only, 30 days, guys. It's but like, only one child only this time. One child no this time. no fire drill. It's a lot easier. Just, just the one child. Yeah, so. and I can chuck her back into the child care and go get my Yeah, check into over. summer swim lessons because uh, our Y is doing them every day because it's summer. Uh, yeah. and when school gets back in, they'll do them in the afternoons. But it's kind of nice, and I think our kids have progressed faster through the Big lessons time. because they are every day. They're Monday through Thursday, so not every single day, but uh, enough It feels that, like every day. Yeah, it does. <laughs> enough that they, they definitely are getting to build on those skills so yeah our family our family's all about swim lately thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey please engage with us on social media join our homeschool together podcast group on facebook and find us at homeschool together podcast on instagram we'd love to hear your feedback questions and recommendations until next time happy homeschooling